All right, hi, this is Nima, and this is joint work with my friends Aditya and Elliot called Selling to a Group. Consider a seller that sells a single product to a group of buyers who pay for this product using some money that they collectively own as a group. Let me give you an example. Imagine that the seller is selling a software to a company. So this software could be something like a cloud service or a cybersecurity software that the company can use and the company pays for it using company money. So notice two important features. One is that the software is not sold to any given individual. It is instead sold to the group of individuals. And second and similarly, the money is not coming from each individual's pocket, but instead coming from a collective pool of money that the company owns. There are many other examples with these features. For example, a daycare who sells childcare services to a household who pays for this childcare service using household money. Or a contractor who sells construction services like for roads and bridges to a city council who pays for this service using city money. And again, in all this example, what is common is one that the product is sold collectively to the group. And second and similarly, that the group collectively pays for this money from not individual pockets, but from the collective uh, pool of money that they own. For the rest of the talk, I will stick to the example of selling a software to a company. We assume that each agent in this group has a private value for this software, and these values are privately known. They're drawn independently from each other, from known distributions, but those distributions need not be identified. So let me explain what does a value mean when we don't allow individual transfers? The so meaning of value V1 is that the CEO thinks that the software is worth exactly V1 dollars in terms of company money. In other words, the CEO would be indifferent between these two outcomes, one in which the company pays V1 dollars for the software and the other one in which the company does not buy the software. She would prefer the company to buy the software if the price is strictly less than you want. She would prefer the company to not buy it if the price is strictly more than you want. Um, we don't take a stance in this paper up on where these values are coming from or why they could be different. Instead, you're interested in how does this heterogeneity affect the design of mechanisms? But just so you have some story in mind, uh, you can imagine that these values are different because these agents have different opinions about the opportunity cost of spending this money elsewhere. For example, the CEO may think that if they don't buy this software, then the company can use this money to hire some people in marketing. And she thinks that the company really needs to hire people in marketing. So she has a low value for, for buying this software. But on the other hand, the CTO, who doesn't care so much about marketing, and only cares about improving this company's tech have a higher value for this stuff. And as I said, our question is, what mechanism is optimal, meaning maximizes the seller's expected debt? We focus on direct incentive compatible mechanisms. A direct mechanism is one in which each agent reports his or her value. The, the, the mechanism decides whether the software is allocated and how much the group pays. A mechanism is incentive compatible if each agent maximizes his or her utility by reporting truthfully. Utility here is simply value times the probability of selling the software minus how much the group pays. And individual rationality means that the expected utility of each type of each agent is not negative. To develop some intuition, let's think about an example. So let's suppose that V1 is drawn uniformly from zero to two, V2 is drawn uniformly from zero to three. What is the optimal mechanism? You may notice that a special case of this problem is when you have a single agent, where we know from standard theory, the optimal mechanism to, would be to simply put a price tag on this software and let that agent decide if he wants it or not. So it would be natural to try to extend this mechanism, this posted pricing mechanism to our setting where you have multiple agents. A naive extension would be to put a price tag on the software and ask one of the two agents if they think that the software should be sold at that price. For example, here, maybe because the CTO tend to have a higher value, 
you could ask the CTO if he thinks that the product is, should, should be sold at price three over two. This mechanism is not IR. Why? Because when the value of the CEO is zero, she thinks the product is worth nothing in terms of the company money, but the company sometimes with positive probability pays for it because the CTO thinks it's worth it. So a more sophisticated extension of a posted pricing mechanism would be to require unanimous approval. The price the product is sold if both agents agree to buy it at price P. This mechanism is clearly incentive compatible and individually rational. You can maximize the revenue by optimizing this uh, optimization problem. The numbers don't matter so much. What matters is that this mechanism is also not, in, not optimal. The optimal mechanism has a much more nuanced allocation rule. In particular, the allocation rule is that the product is sold if and only if a weighted sum of the two agents' values is above a given threshold for rates and a threshold that is specified down here. And trust me that there is a payment rule that makes this mechanism uh, incentive compatible. So the main theorem of this paper is to generalize this observation and characterize what optimal mechanisms look like. The optimal mechanism is characterized in these three steps. Step number one specifies what the optimal allocation rule is. It says that the optimal allocation rule maximizes a weighted sum of agents virtual values. The second part specifies what these weights look like. The optimal weights minimize a, a weighted virtual surplus. And part number three specifies what the transfer rule is to make this mechanism incentive compatible. Let me explain a bit more detail. Part one says that the optimal allocation is to allocate the product if and only if a weighted sum of agents virtual values according to some weights W star is positive where these virtual values PI of VI is defined according to the standard definition of virtual values. Part number two identifies exactly what these weights are. It says that these weights should minimize virtual surplus. There should be solution to this problem where you maximize over all possible weights this expectation. And I call this expected virtual surplus. Why? Because given step one, we know that the mechanism sells the product whenever the weighted sum of virtual values is positive. In that case, the weighted virtual surplus is just this weighted sum. And it doesn't sell it whenever it is negative. So in that case, the virtual surplus is zero. And part number two says that these weights must minimize this weighted sum. Part number three, specifies what the appropriate payment rule is to make this mechanism incentive compatible, I just tell you that such payment rule exists. So there is a payment rule that makes this allocation rule incentive compatible by satisfying the payment identity. So for the next couple of slides, I will just tell you some, give you some idea about how we prove this result to two steps. The first step is more or less standard. It is to write down revenue in terms of the virtual surplus of a given allocation group. So the lemma is as follows. If you give me a mechanism with interim allocation rules, X1 to Xn, you can write down the optimal revenue just in terms of this allocation. So you can get rid of the payment group. So what is Xi of Vi? Xi of Vi specifies what is the probability that the software is sold when the value of agent I is Vi. This lemma says, if you multiply this probability by the virtual value of agent I, take the expectation of that, and then minimize over all agents, this is what the optimal revenue is. So this inner expectation should look familiar to you. This is just the expected virtual surplus according to agent I. What should be a bit mysterious at this point is why do we have this min over here? And to explain this, Let's think for a second about another version of the problem where individual transfers are allowed. So we don't allow this, but let's think about it for a second. What would happen in that case if the mechanism could define individual transfers for agents? The standard analysis there tells us that the optimal revenue is the sum over all agents, their virtual surplus 
but here we have me. So what's going on? When we have individual transfers, we can argue that every single agent's IR constraint must bind. Why? If some agent's IR constraint is slack, we can just increase the transfer of that agent and improve revenue. Now, this trick doesn't work in our setting because we don't have individual transfers. What we can guarantee instead is that at least one agent's IR constraint must bind. If every agent's IR constraint is slack, we can uniformly increase the amount of money that the group pays and increase revenue. So given this, the agent whose IR constraint is slack turns out to be exactly the agent whose virtual surplus is minimized and therefore we get this uh, expression for revenue. Now, a key step in proving this lemma is to show that if you give me a profile of interim allocation rules, I can implement that and we show this using a novel result regarding implementation of allocation rules. Now, given this step, we move on to step two, write down the problem as follows. You maximize over allocation rules, the revenue of that allocation rule, which by the first step is this expression. Now, the main conceptual step in this paper is to think of this max mean problem as a zero sum two player game where a maximizer is the role player who chooses an allocation rule. And then the minimizer is a column player who chooses an agent. And then the payoff that's realized is the expected virtual surplus of that agent for that allocation. Now, without loss, we can allow the minimizer to randomize, right? That's not gonna change anything. But then the nice thing is that you can apply the min max theorem and flip the order of the max and the mean. We could say, let's let mean move first. The minimizer would move first by choosing a distribution over agents. Then the maximizer moves by choosing an allocation. And now the, the payoff would be the expected virtual surplus according to the probabilities that the minimizer has chosen. Now, the nice thing about flipping the order is that we know how to solve the inner problem. The inner problem is simply now to maximize a weighted sum of virtual values. So you allocate whenever this weighted sum is positive. Therefore, we can get rid of this inner problem. This is exactly what our main theorem says. At this point, you can ask, well, what can we say about these weights? How do they look like? When are they high and when are they low? In particular, for which agents is this weight higher? In a sense, a agent, an agent whose weight is high is an agent who the mechanism pays more attention to. They're more, imp more important for deciding the outcome of the mechanism. And the answer is the weaker one, as we formalize in this proposition. This proposition says, if the virtual value of agent one is smaller than the virtual value of agent two in the hazard grade order, then agent one has a higher weight than agent two. And I'm interpreting this condition as saying that if agent one is weaker than agent two, in the sense it overall, he has lower values than agent two. Notice that this is a stochastic order. This is an order on this distribution of the two agents virtual values. It says you should compare the hazard rates of the distribution of P1 with the hazard rate of the distribution of P2. Now, I'm not gonna prove this result. I'm gonna just give you some intuition about it by doing some analysis of, a, of an example. So let's go back to our example where V1 is uniform zero to two, V2 is uniform zero, uh, one to three. So in a sense, CEO is weaker than the CTO. CEO has a lower value than the CTO. And our proposition says that the weight assigned to the CEO should be higher than the weight assigned to the CTO. So the mechanism should listen more to the CEO than the CTO. I'm not gonna prove this. Instead, I will argue that if the mechanism has to choose only one agent and listen only to that one agent, it better listen to the CEO and not the CTO. Why? Let's do it case by case. What would happen if the mechanism listens only to the CTO? Then uh, we can post a price if the CTO agrees, but then we argue that this mechanism is not IR. To make this IR, you have to pay a subsidy to the company. And this subsidy turns out that exactly cancels off the revenue you make, so revenue will be zero. What would happen if the, company, if the seller only listens to the CEO? You could sell a, the product at a price if the CEO agrees. This mechanism is IR, because notice that the CTO always thinks that the product is worth at least $1. 
So he is willing to accept this mechanism. So this mechanism makes positive revenue by only listening to the weaker agent. Now, there are many extensions that I didn't have time to discuss. I'm happy to discuss them over the poster session. I'm just gonna briefly go over them. Posted pricing is not even approximate yet. Then you may ask, what about other mechanisms? Maybe we wanna understand what the sell buyer optimal mechanism is or for a single buyer, what is the optimal mechanism? We in fact characterize Pareto efficient mechanisms and we show that they very nicely generalize our seller optimal mechanism in the sense that a Pareto efficient mechanism maximizes a weighted sum of not only the agent's virtual values, but also their values. So this would be an extension of, of our seller optimal mechanism. Um, another question is we require a very strong notion of IR. We require that every single agent must agree to this mechanism. What if the seller only needs to get the approval of one of the many agents or maybe half of the agents? So for example, what if a seller of daycare services should only get either the mom's approval or the dad's approval? Or a seller to a city council requires only approval of a majority of the city council. So there are some very interesting conceptual challenges here, which is that once you don't require unanimous approval anymore, there could be equilibria in which the mechanism asks for a billion dollars and everybody votes yes, because just a single agent changing their vote to no is not gonna change anything. So how do we deal with these silly equilibria? Another extension or similar problem is, what if agents do pay out of pocket, but in fixed shapes? So an example is, let's suppose that the mom and the dad gets a, get a divorce, but they agree that the mom has to pay two thirds of the childcare and the dad has to pay a third of the childcare. So now it's coming from their pockets, but in a fixed year. Turns out that after appropriate renormalization, this exactly reduces to our problem, where our, our, our main theorem says that the optimal mechanism should pay more attention to mom, to the person who is more on the hook for paying for the product. And finally, Correlated values, in our setting, the kramer mclean kind of tricks don't apply because the seller cannot design individual transfers for different agents. So this would be an interesting place to study correlated values. So let me wrap up. We studied a setting with a single seller, single buyer, and a single product where posted pricing is not up. And the, the, mo the main point here is that the single buyer has multiple decision makers within it. The optimal mechanism pays more attention to weaker agents. So that's it. Thanks for paying attention. I'm happy to discuss it over the poster session.